Greetings, dear listener. This is the Nook Podcast. My name is Stephen, and I am so honored to have you listening today. This podcast is about real faith in real time, because faith in Jesus is messy. I might even go as far as saying that if it isn't messy, it isn't faith. If you are still checking out the claims of Jesus, this is a safe place to just listen, take it in. And if you have any questions, you can email me. The address is stephen at nookpodcast.com. That address is always in the show notes if you'd like to drop me a line. We are continuing in this series looking at various aspects of depression. And going all the way back to the planning stages, I knew that I had to dedicate an episode to teenagers. Statistics show that this age group is one of the fastest growing in percentages of reported cases of depression, self-harm, and suicide. Emergency department staff will tell you this is a crisis. Mom says I am so good at making something out of nothing and then flat out asks me if I am afraid of dying. No, I am afraid of living. Every piece of you, every basic primal piece of you is screaming for you to survive. You don't want to talk about it. In this episode, we are taking a close look at depression among our young people. Kids aged 12 to 17 have the highest percentage of depression and trends show that it is on the increase. That age group is going through the harsh transition from child to adolescent to adult in such a short amount of time. Their bodies and brains are developing at such a crazy rate that it makes it incredibly difficult to keep any kind of healthy perspective on any number of things. Mix in the constant bombardment of social media and peer pressure, and these kids have a hard time knowing which way is up. So today I read a piece in The Atlantic by Derek Thompson that hit close to home as a parent, and it was about rising levels of teen sadness, depression, anxiety, mental health issues in teens. That is Dr. Zubin Demania. He's an American physician and assistant professor of medicine at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas School of Medicine. This is a really good dive into the biology of what our kids are dealing with. But I want to talk about it and digest it for you because I think this is crucial as the next generation is coming up and we're seeing really epidemic levels of unhappiness in kids. And it's partially our fault, so we can actually fix this. So Derek starts by kind of pointing out that since 2009, levels of self-reported sadness, depression, anxiety, et cetera, in kids have skyrocketed, more so in girls than boys. And so there's a few things to digest here. Number one, is it real? And so there's sort of three things he goes through that are kind of these fallacies that people have that, no, maybe it's not real because first of all, um, could it be that teens are just buttholes? And of course they're gonna say these things because they've been doing bad activities forever. But the truth is, if you actually look at data, there's less drinking and driving, less uh, early sex, less alcohol abuse, less all kinds of the kind of things that we used to do when we were kids that uh, in kids now. So it's probably not that. It's also not a question of over-reporting. So yeah, we've destigmatized mental illness to some degree. So maybe kids are more comfortable saying, oh, I feel sad or I'm depressed or whatever. And, And that's all great and possibly a small component of it. But then you can actually look at ER visits for suicide attempts and for self harm, cutting and things like that. So actual and and eating disorders, things like that, they've all risen. And in fact, emergency department staff will tell you this is a crisis. Those thoughts are backed up by Dr. Darian Sutton, emergency medical physician in New York City. These are some incredibly concerning trends that we're seeing in the trends of adolescent mental health. Uh, What it seems as though is that children, adolescents, and young adults are facing considerable challenges that are uh, augmented or exacerbated by the pandemic. In a recent report covering 80,000 youth globally, it found that symptoms of depression and anxiety doubled during the pandemic, with 25% of youth experiencing 
experiencing symptoms of depression and 20% experiencing symptoms of anxiety. Also, ER visits for suspected attempts of self-harm have increased by over 50% among girls. And that's one of the most striking factors that we see in this report. And the access seems to be the primary issue. Access to diagnostic testing, to therapy, and to pharmaceutical interventions. So hopefully this will increase funding to mental health programs, as well as access to these communities in need. The teenaged brain is already prone to mood swings. With so much still forming and changing, they can have a really hard time as it is. Add in depression and anxiety, and the changes in mood and behavior can spin out of control. And that's just scratching the surface on what is happening internally. Then you have to consider what these kids are dealing with on the outside. I recently met Jamie Kirshner. She's been volunteering in youth ministry for 20 years. As you might imagine, she has seen scores of teenagers in all the various stages of growth. So many ups and downs and everything in between. I started by asking her if she could sum up how she sees today's teenager. They're just complacent. They're mm -hmm. just, they're, they're hurting but they don't want to reach out. They're kind of off to themselves. The phones, uh, they're, they're buried behind their phones and that's where they hide. And so yeah. it's it's been a challenge. I will say in the last couple of years, it's been a very big challenge to just really reach the hearts of these teens. A lot of them, I don't see them working through their growing pains. I see them hiding. Uh, with the ones that are, they reach out, they talk, they ask questions. There's a girl in our youth ministry. And it's so funny because really, it just takes us listening, I think, as youth leaders it just takes us really listening and not just letting them get away with <laughs> hiding behind their phones, but going to talk to them and really letting them know that you genuinely care. Mm -hmm. Because like, there's a girl that I think about and I've heard people kind of talk about her, um, just not like, she's just very depressed and very, uh, just has like so many, like these dark thoughts and things like that. And I'll go and sit down with her and she'll open up her heart to me. And she, it's amazing to see, how she's like, she's asking for help. And she's like, what do I do? Like, mm. what what can I do to help overcome this? And they really want people to reach past them. But I think that they're so used to people looking at teens and saying, yeah, they're just a teen, they'll get over it. Or, you know, like, they're just not sure what to do with it, or if it's just drama, or yeah, <laughs> whatever. Exactly. And like, and so they just kind of overlook it. And they don't actually sit down and listen to the heart of these teens. I'll tell you what, like when I was a teen, it was hard. Yeah. <laughs> it was hard walking through those years. I can't even imagine being a teen today, having to walk through COVID and all of the shutdowns and being isolated and then having to get back out in public again. I can't even imagine where they're walking through today. Like I, I know that it's hard and I know that they need somebody to just listen to them. Yeah. Well, gosh, and you, I, it's funny, you, I, you say that I hadn't even really considered that, that these kids that are already tending to turn inward and hide behind the phones and, and think that because they've got X amount of followers on Instagram or whatever, that they can fool themselves into feeling connected, yet still all the more isolated. And now, like you just said, basically having to reintroduce themselves into public life, um, is that I imagine that you've got to see really rough patches for some of these kids just being back out amongst people on a regular basis. I think a lot of it, a lot of what I see, the biggest challenge, I guess I should say, that I see among these teens is they don't know how to communicate with each other anymore. And so that's why they are turning inward because they don't know. They can talk on, you know, a... Uh, uh, headphones and a microphone and they can talk to each other on, on video, but seeing somebody face to face, they don't know how to talk to each other anymore. Like the communication is just, it's very lacking. And because it's scary and because it's now become an issue of comfort zone, like breaking out of that, they turn inward. And so it's, it's, it's very, it's a very interesting dynamic that we're seeing today. Especially with you in youth ministry and you're really trying to get them to engage. Uh, it's like, I, I can only imagine for you, it's like having to pull twice as hard to get them to get involved here. This is a place where you can find community and find acceptance. Yeah. And I mean, we see it among the adults too. I think that they say that the average church has regathered about 35% of what they were before mm -hmm. COVID. 
And our church is about 60%, praise God. But like, they're seeing that with the adults or seeing that with their parents, that their parents aren't engaged anymore, yeah. that they're not communicating anymore. They'd rather be at home and watch church on online instead of be out and with people. And so this is only adding to that challenge that these teens are having with communication. Yeah. Well, and, and this is, this all goes towards laying a little bit of a foundation. And while I feel like there's probably some necessity to claiming that neither you nor I are health, uh, mental health experts, you're, you're in there neck deep with, with high school students. Um, this is one of the hardest hit age groups for depression, anxiety, and a litany of other mental health issues. Uh, I'm curious on, on that category by itself, what have you seen? A lot. <laughs> I imagine. A lot. I mean, it's these people are, I mean, these teens are hurting. Yeah. They're, they're hurting and they don't know how to express themselves. And I mean... In Proverbs, it says, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desires and and pushes away, basically, godly counsel. Yeah. And so, like, that's what we're seeing. That exact thing is what we're seeing. They're pushing away the people who really care about them, and they're turning inward. And it's like, it's honestly, it breaks our hearts mm. because we want to see these teens win in life. We want to see them enjoy their life. And like you said, we're not mental health, mental health experts. That's not our job description. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel like a lot of times in the church, in the youth ministry, we are under taught how to, mm. how to work with these. Like we're not actually taught how to talk to students who are dealing with mental health issues. We're not yeah. taught on how, like, what are the next steps that they need to take? We're not taught. I mean, we know from the word of God, we can encourage them with the word of God, but other, like outside of that professional help, I don't even know who to say to send them to. Right. <laughs> Well, and how brutally frustrating that's got to be for you when you can see a student who is truly struggling. And I, well, just the example that you gave there about the young lady that that honestly, obviously, just needed somebody to listen to her. But how many others go unreached because they just aren't willing to open up or for that matter, don't have someone like yourself who will say, hold on, let me try to break through this and, and let's talk about this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's a lot, there are a lot and it's just really, it's, <laughs> we find ourselves sometimes having to force past those, those comfort zones. And just every single week we go and we talk to the same person every week. And even though they're not talking back to us, they're not even looking at us mm -hmm. or they may treat us with like a, a, a bad behavior, like just a bad attitude or something like that. You know, we, every single week we have to just love them with the love that God has given us, his unconditional love and go, Every single week, talk to those people. Hey, just want you to know that I'm praying for you and yeah. I'm here for you if you need anything. And just just sitting there and, and it's amazing. If you're persistent, it, the, the doors will be open because they realize that you're not giving up, that you're not going to leave. The all too familiar peer pressure, the comparison trap, and the constant overload of social media. These kids are living under the strain of trying to live lives that don't really exist in attempts to impress people they will probably never know. I reached out to my friend Steve Trigoboff for a conversation. He's been teaching high school science and biology for more than 30 years and has seen these kids, our kids, trying to navigate all of this in a public high school. When kids open up to you as a teacher, they will open up and you better be ready for it because they will unload on you if they if they feel safe enough to do that. And so it, it is definitely an evolution of time. And and so I do observe that I've seen the kids go through uh, an emotional gamut um, and those that I know that deal with depression directly because either a they've shared that with me um, or b through. Um, our communications, like through their counselors, where mm. they're dealing with something. Um, I think this last school year, I think I had four students that went into hospitalization for um, serious depression or suicidal. Um, and, and sometimes as a teacher, it's I, I don't agree with it, but they keep you in the dark about some of the details. Hmm. I don't need to know the details just to know the details. 
it's just helpful to understand, you know, where things come from instead of just giving us broad, generalized information like, you know, the student is struggling with suicide, boom, and they just leave it at that. I, I've had four kids that have been hospitalized, you know, and then come back to school mm. over a period of time of a week or two weeks away. And I think out of those four, two of them um, at some point in time went back into hospitalization uh, because of that same reason. So, you know, that didn't happen 15 years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Yeah. So we definitely see it more. And uh, I think all four of those kids, I at least built a relationship with those kids where there's a cut. There was two of them. I could, I would never have guessed it. Mm. Not one bit. When I found out, I was just like jaw dropped. Like, are you serious? Wow. Um, and two of them I know were battling with stuff because even the courses I taught, I would I would get those kids as freshmen, and then I might get them again in in my upper level class when they were a junior. So I had I had been able to build a relationship with them, or, you know, over just not one course, but over several years. Yeah. And so a couple of them I just knew their story. And, um, but there's two of them that I just, I did, would never had a clue. Mm. So curiously then you, you, you talk about them going away and they're gone for a week or so. Yeah. How do they come back from something like that? How do they return to class or some kind of normalcy? Oddly, it's almost as if they weren't gone. Hmm. They, they, in terms, if you're asking like in their behavior, when they come back, it's that they, there, there's topics like that about their personal lives and stuff like that that are kind of like those are out of bounds. Mm. Those are not things you share with. They'll share other stuff about it, but th there's, you know, about the personal areas of their life that are struggles is not something that you see kids share at least to, uh, to a teacher. Yeah. And I think I speak for other teachers too, at least where I'm at. Um, if you, you hear things, it's sometimes where you're having a conversation with a kid and they, they give you some very specific wordage or language or the way they're talking to you that you pick up on and you mm. go, something's, something's up if they don't just directly tell you. And some of them right. will just flat out tell you. I mean, they, they won't beat around the bush about it. They'll just say, Hey, I'm, I'm struggling with this. And, and, you know, and then our conversation can sometimes go a lot faster mm. because they just directly share with you, but it's being sensitive about what, what is this and making sure they're safe and okay too. Yeah. Is, do you have things that you would attribute that to? Why is it so tough to get past the crust with some 15 year old kid in the now that maybe wasn't there 15, 20 years ago? You know, I, I think we go back to like when we were in high school, right? And all of us had some level of insecurity. Sure. Some of us more, some of us less. I think that's human nature. Yep. Even as adults, we still have it in certain areas. So I, I use that word security because I think that's where it is. It lies in that they're, as a general population of kids, and it doesn't mean all kids, but I see more and more kids is how I explain this, that have this where they're they're very insecure about themselves in so many different ways mm. and because they're insecure about themselves in so many different ways it's very difficult for them to open up uh engage mm. in daily activities even just what we would we would probably look at as just basic things it becomes difficult for them to engage and step out and again, human nature, it's difficult for us to try new things sometimes. Is there, have you found any, or do you really just kind of have to play it almost, you know, class by class or student by student in, you know, do you have some, I hate to use the word trick, but do you have tricks or, or, you know, do you have kind of a, a metaphorical goodie bag of, well, here's something I've done before that gets a kid talking. I'll try that, or I'll try this, you know, things I, like that. Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, it's through the process of just doing this for a long time and growing myself is that number one, you you have to really want to listen. 
And that, mm. that's the difference between being cliched and be saying um, to, I, I really want to hear you. That's mm. really what the difference is. And, and that's part of my growth, you know, as a person in general and as a teacher too, but as a person that helps you everywhere. And I think the kids pick up, they're very intuitive about that stuff. And just like anybody, but they're not too young to not. So they're very intuitive to know the difference, whether you're just listening to them or you want to hear them. Yeah. And, and, and it's interesting that you call it that like a goodie bag or a trick. And I, it, it's a trigger. I think if, if I feel like we're at a place and sometimes it's because of something going on or something happening at school or in world or whatever, or many times they just off the cuff bring up a topic then I look at that as an open door, a lead in mm. to, to, to discuss things. And like I said, once you, I think, build that rapport with them as a group or whatever. And, and I have everywhere from freshmen to seniors. So you have to, they're different yeah. by age groups too. And those juniors and seniors can be more likely to discuss that. But uh, it's usually because I ask them, I'll ask them, how do you guys feel about this? What do you think about that? Yep. And I think that's the initial thing. If, if your first thing is to ask how they feel or what they think th they like to share that versus let me tell you yeah. what you need to hear from me. Um, mm -hmm. And it starts that dialogue much better and they, they, they want to be heard. They want to tell things, I think. Um, and they just have to know that. And that that's nice because it really does. I've learned that that begins a dialogue. So that's probably the one thing is you build that rapport and then you, you ask them the questions sincerely and and want to hear what they have to say. Uh, for social media's sake, because one of the things I'm looking to touch on here is kind of the comparison trap. And when you and I were in school, it was just really, it was all about window dressing. And is, does so-and-so look cool today? Is, is that one girl that you think is cute? Does she look amazing today? And that's kind of all we had. Whereas now we've got, Instagram and filters and all kinds of stuff. And that, again, that, that public image that kids are trying to control, uh, how do you see that working against them in the, in that comparison trap? And yes, I mean, everything I'm asking right now is kind of funneling back towards, you know, this, the depression element, the, the, the mental health of these students. So if it, is there a way for you to speak, if only on 30 plus years, where you've seen social media, the comparison and what that what that's doing to a kid? They're thinking they're building themselves or they're maintaining something. But how do you see it working against them? That they see just this constant barrage of stuff in front of them from lifestyles to what you look like, to what you're wearing, to how you're making easy money. And it, they see so much of it, like so much of it, because they're looking at it so much that they believe that's real. Mm. And I think it goes back to that insecurity. They don't see themselves as that person, that dress, that look, that money, um, that gift or talent. And therefore, it immediately makes that insecurity even greater for them. And where they go from that, I think it just depends on, again, it goes back to the people in their lives, their family, those people that they have a direct connection to that, that really is going to share with them through a time and experience that that's not real mm. and that you're okay. Yeah. You don't have to meet that standard you see on your phone because you don't even know if it's real. You think it might be, but. You know, you have to understand that you have a God created image and that's what is most important, it, that it's not a mistake. It is good. It is great. It is worthy. Mm. And I think it's just somehow getting kids to see themselves that way instead of what they see on screens. That's the hard part. What does it mean to you to be safe? that that a student can feel safe with you to whether that means that they just become a sponge and want to absorb what you're teaching or maybe even take it a step further to know that you are someone they can confide in um, and find that safeness in. I look at it like that is that 
teaching is kind of a vehicle for me to intermingle into kids' lives at a, a vulnerable time and and know that God's put me in that place to be there and and, and make a difference. It, it, not to sound cliche, but if at least one kid out of, you know, 300 that year, there was one or two, then I, I that's worth it. A teenager who is slipping into depression will stop doing things they really enjoy. They lose interest in being part of the family unit. They have difficulty concentrating and their grades can go drastically downhill. Yes, some of these things sound relatively normal for the teen years, but that should never be an excuse to turn a blind eye to what could be a more serious problem. As I was planning this episode, I was hoping to connect with someone in this age group who has dealt with this. That person turned out to be Shannon Monet. And while I'm grateful that she was willing to share some of her story, it pains me to know that she has had to deal with depression and she's only 15 years old and that it started years before that. Well, it actually was right, right back when I was in fifth, fourth grade, fourth grade, oh, and then wow. fourth or fifth grade, yes. So that's when I was struggling with it. You know, one day I was crying in my bedroom and my mother was actually in the other room just folding clothes and I ended up hearing footsteps. So I made sure I dried my tears so she wouldn't see that I was crying. Hmm. You know, in that moment, I was really like doubting God, questioning if he was real because he made me different from other kids my age. Hmm. And my mindset has just always been different. And I got bullied for that. But anyway, back to my bedroom, I was in my bedroom crying and my mom didn't even hear me. But hmm. she ended up walking in my room and she automatically started praying for me. Hmm. And God, it, I knew it was a God sent sure. and God started. Yeah. And God gave her a vision of me sitting alone at the lunch table. And when she told me that I really could do nothing but cry because she didn't know anything that I was going through in school. And I made sure I didn't tell her. And it was really that night where God really revealed to me that he was with me the entire time. If, there, if there's a way for you to, to dial back just a little bit to some of those rougher days what what did you know your particular case of of depression how did that kind of manifest itself for you well it really manifests from really just being bullied mm. and i was also the only black kid in my classroom so that really didn't help me out at all mm. and a, a lot of kids bullied me and they point out every flaw and imperfection and i really tried to live up to their standards and please them and I ended up masking who I really was, but it really never worked. And I used to be really bold, honestly, but it turned into fear and anxiety and depression over time because I was carrying unhappiness and suicidal thoughts really developed in my mind just because of what people said about me. So I became really insecure and I just didn't like who I was anymore. So that's how it really started. I kept it to myself hmm. and just getting bullied every day. I had to like withdraw from everybody. I used to just walk around like the playground because nobody wanted to talk to me or whatsoever. So it was really rough. I never really told my parents at all. Was there, was there something or was, was there a point that you arrived at where you felt like you had to tell your, your immediate family about what you had been dealing with? Well, I wanted to tell my mother multiple times, but I really kept it boxed in yeah. because I felt like, you know, I don't know. I just felt ashamed, honestly. Yeah. I didn't feel like if I tell her, you know, like, I don't know what she'll say. So I'm just like, you know, let me keep it to myself. So I kept it boxed in. You're 15. You're still very young and you're already dealing with some struggles with depression in one of the toughest hit age groups for the condition. How are you contending with that? Well, it's really just by God's help, because without him, I wouldn't have been able to make it. Hmm. It was really with his, the, his word, honestly, and also having a strong family yeah. household as well. And even my church family, that's mm. all, that also helps, you know, even in that state of feeling alone, you still know that there are people there for you. Right. So having them as well was also a huge help. Well, what do you see in your peers? I mean, you, you've, you're 15, you got to know plenty of kids that are around your age. 
do you feel like you're the only one or have you have you found friends that you, you've made good connections with that way that maybe you you know somebody who's struggling with stuff as well? Yes, I've actually found a lot of kids that actually come to me mm-hmm. and they're mainly actually girls who actually come to me um, yeah. who deal with depression because females actually have developed depression twice as often than males. Right. So I noticed that a lot are struggling with identity issues mm. and um, also addiction or spending a lot of time on social media where it's affecting, yeah. you know, their mind. And I'm seeing a lot of that. Um, with that, I first of all, I'm, I'm so glad that you're you're so outspoken about this. Uh, I'm going to guess that because you have been outspoken about it, that does that make you easily approachable for for friends, for, for maybe even people who don't even know you to, to reach out and speak with you about that kind of stuff? Yes. It, yes, it does. It, it's just truly amazing how how much of an impact that God has made through me. Mm. Because if, if I didn't follow what he told me to do, you know, I wouldn't have been in this position at all. So I'm just so thankful that I'm able to help multiple teams and everything. What is my North Star in this episode? What do I want you to walk away with after listening to this? I can't just chalk it up to awareness. But at the same time, I don't have a specific call to action here as I wrap this up. I hope that there is a message here that says we can't be passive about this. The teenagers that you either have in your house or come in contact with are so susceptible to mental health issues. And we who are a few miles ahead of them need to be mindful of that. This is one of the times when it takes a village to raise a child really comes to the surface. Even if you don't have any idea what to do, choose to pray. Pray for that teenager in your life. Pray for the youth pastor at your church. Pray for the teachers at your local high school. Pray when you see a group of teenagers hanging out in a restaurant. We all know that teenagers are still doing a whole lot of growing up. Then if you throw a bad case of depression or anxiety in the mix, things can go sideways in a hurry. The propensity for self-harm, eating disorders, and suicidal thoughts are just brutal to me. We can't just tell these kids that they need Jesus and send them on their way. 1 Timothy 4.12 says to not let anyone think less of you because you are young. Well, let's flip that around and not be the one thinking less of anyone because they are young. I've got links in the show notes if you would like more information about healthy ways of dealing with teenage depression. You can also find links to the Nook Facebook page and my social media feeds. And make sure that you are following or subscribe to this show on your favorite podcast app. Thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you here next time in the Nook. The Nook Podcast is a production of Sozo Digital Media.